On February the 27th, 2022, days after Russia invaded Ukraine, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz delivered what was hyped as a history-changing speech. Declaring a Zeitenwende, or turning point, Scholz committed to a massive increase in defense spending, to transforming his nation into a military superpower. At the time, most media lapped it up. It seemed undeniable that Central Europe was undergoing an epoch-shaking shift, a shift that would see the rise of a new defense player. Flash forward 10 months, and we now know this was true, only not in the way Scholz meant. Because while Germany's attempts to become the hard man of Europe have floundered, there's one nearby nation that really has been transformed, that really is on the course to becoming dominant. The name of that nation? Poland. And it could be Europe's next superpower. Since February, Warsaw has pledged to increase its defense spending to 5% of GDP. The government has struck massive arms deals with America and South Korea, including plans to turn Poland into a tank manufacturing powerhouse. But what would it mean for Poland to have the greatest military east of France? And can the government really fulfill its spending pledges? So join us today as we analyze Central Europe's rising power and discuss how this shift could transform Europe for decades to come. For most people living in Central and Eastern Europe, the modern era can be divided neatly into two blocks, divided by a jagged line, a blood-red crack running right through the morning of one day, February the 24th, 2022. That day, Russia launched its brutal assault on Ukraine, triggering a war that continues to kill thousands of Europeans. And while Ukraine's brave defense has halted the threat that Russia would keep rolling west, the aftershocks of that horrific morning are still felt. From the Baltics to the Balkans, nations are adjusting to a dangerous new reality, one in which Russia is no longer a potential menace on their doorsteps, but an active threat, one in which Estonians, Czechs, Slovaks, Romanians, Lithuanians, and more could be forced to fight for their freedom. Yet for all the impact that February day had across Europe's east, nowhere has it arguably been felt more than in Poland. Bordered to its east by Putin ally Belarus and to its north by the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad, Warsaw has long been wary of the wannabe Tsar in Moscow. In recent months, though, that wariness has translated into action. From an already strong 2.2% in 2021, the PIS-led government now wants to spend 3% of GDP on defense. And that's just for starters. The goal is to eventually reach 5%, a move that would proportionally at least make Poland NATO's biggest spender by far. This has been matched by equally tough rhetoric. For Poland's Independence Day, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki declared that the Polish army must be so powerful that it does not have to fight due to its strength alone. Still, there can always be gaps between words and actions. And it's the possible existence of these gaps that we'll be investigating in today's video. Before we get into that, though, it's worth exploring how we got here, how Poland became mentally prepared for such an epoch-shaking shift. To do that, we need to travel back in time, back to the dawn of the 1990s and the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. Back then, it wouldn't have seemed particularly noteworthy that Poland might be a military power. Through most of the Cold War, the socialist government had controlled the second largest army among Warsaw Pact nations, behind only the USSR. But when communism collapsed, Poland suddenly found itself incapable of maintaining a large military. Thankfully, this was a time when the country that had dominated it for so long, Russia, was also a broke basket case, barely able to hold itself together. Not that Warsaw was willing to wait around for Moscow to return to its colonial exploits. In 1999, Poland made a successful bid with the Czech Republic and Hungary for NATO membership, seen as the only security guarantee worth a damn. And that's because of Article 5, the part of the NATO treaty that says an attack on one is an attack on all. And that all includes two European nuclear powers, France and Britain, plus the almighty military juggernaut known as America. Sadly, some now think NATO membership was too effective, lulling Poland into a false sense of security. Even as Putin's Russia began launching military adventures in Chechnya and Georgia, Poland's government was reducing its standing army to just 100,000. Like many in the West, the assumption was the country would never have to fight a major land war again. That being a modern military meant having a small, professional force supplied with high-tech kit for limited overseas engagements. But then two things happened that turned every assumption on its head. The first was Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea, which was effectively ignored in Western Europe, but rattled nerves in the East. The second was the 
2015 rise to power of Poland's current hard-right nationalist government led by PIS. For PIS, the reduction of Poland's armed forces in an age of Russian aggression has been a little like stripping naked and smearing yourself in honey while living next to a hungry bear. They launched a recruitment drive for the military, hiking wages to help attract new soldiers. In 2017, they created the Volunteer Territorial Defense Forces. Yet enlistment numbers stayed stubbornly low. The army only grew by 13%, and the Territorial Defense Forces never got close to its goal of 50,000 members. For a while, it seemed like PIS was just chasing a right-wing vanity project, that even with Trump threatening to pull the US out of NATO and Emmanuel Macron calling the alliance brain-dead, there was no need to waste so much money on soldiers. And then came February the 24th and the Russian missiles, the Kremlin's threats to denazify Eastern Europe. The sense that the stable world we'd known as recently as 2019 had collapsed beneath our feet. Today, PIS are leading the charge for rearmament in Europe. The goal is to become strong enough to withstand a full Russian invasion, even if NATO refuses to get involved. And it all starts with an unprecedented splurge in defense spending. Since 2014, all countries in NATO have agreed to spend a minimum of 2% of GDP on defense, a figure which almost nobody actually reaches. While the US spent slightly over 3.5% in 2021, most big European countries didn't even come close. Germany spent a measly 1.5%. Even France, which prides itself on its military prowess, just barely hit the 2% target. Poland, then, was one of those rare countries that regularly exceeded its goal. In 2021, the figure was 2.2% of GDP. Even before war broke out, Warsaw's 2022 target was 2.4%. The Homeland Defense Act turbocharged that increase. Adopted by the same in March of 2022, it catapulted spending to 3%, putting Poland behind only America and Greece among NATO countries. With that extra money, Warsaw intends to more than double its standing army. It intends, too, to hit the 50,000 target for the Territorial Defense Forces. As PIS's leader, Yaroslav Kaczynski, declared in July, the Americans will not defend us if we cannot defend ourselves, and for that, oh, we need a strong army. The implicit criticism was that Warsaw doesn't think anyone else will defend them either. Although it often seems like a monolithic block to outsiders, the EU contains several fault lines, including a great big chasm of mistrust that runs between the East and West. From Warsaw's perspective, Western European nations like France and Germany have been not just unreliable partners, but actively blind to the Russian threat for years. Uh, there was Angela Merkel's 2008 veto on Ukraine joining NATO, Merkel and Scholz's continued champion of Russian gas pipelines to Europe despite the security risks, Macron's endless diplomatic dialogue with Putin that failed to save a single Ukrainian life. For many in the East, this has left a leadership vacuum which someone needs to fill, one made worse by the utter failure of Scholz's Zeitenwende. Despite all the grand promises, Berlin has yet to make good on its historical turning point. In early December, a spokesman uh, was forced to admit Germany uh, would fail to hit its 2% spending target not only in 2022, but also in 2023. And if Berlin won't lead, the thinking seems to be that Warsaw will have to do the job itself. Interestingly, this might not quite be the black eye for Germany that it seems to be. Despite having the world's fourth largest economy, Berlin has long been notorious in NATO circles for kicking back and letting others do all the hard work. The military alliance equivalent of the deadbeat husband farting away on the sofa while his wife does all the cleaning. Previously, this irritated wife was the United States. Today, it's starting to look like Germany has traded her for a younger Polish model. The reason is geographical. If Russia were to invade Europe, it would have to fight its way through Poland to get to Berlin. If Poland is turning itself into a highly armed fortress, then there's less need for the Germans to shoulder the heavy load of defense. At this stage, though, uh, we're still talking somewhat abstractly. GDP spending figures and metaphors about fortresses are all, well, fine enough, but what does it all really mean? So it's time for us to take a deep look at exactly what Warsaw's rising defense budget is intended to buy. At the outbreak of war, Poland's land forces consisted of 113,000 active service men and women spread over four divisions. The number one goal right now is to grow all the way up to six divisions and 300,000 soldiers while also diverting more effort into civilian defense. Most visibly, this will take the form of increasing membership of the Territorial Defense Force, volunteers who receive 16 days training and get together on weekends to rehearse holding off an invasion. For anyone who grew up in the UK, such a description would probably bring to mind Dad's Army and images 
pictures of Captain Mainwaring strutting about with delusions of grandeur. But not in Poland. Warsaw watched last spring as Ukrainian volunteer units wreaked havoc on Russian advances, which may be why the civilian components of the new plan goes way beyond the defense force. Across 2022, the government pushed a plan for more able-bodied people to get onto shooting ranges and learn some skills. Schools even got involved with kids as young as 13 now being taught defense basics. As Prime Minister Morawiecki put it in June, if Russia should ever think to attack Poland, Russia must know that in Poland, 40 million Poles are ready to stand up arms in hand to defend their homeland. Of course, it doesn't matter if you've got 40 or even 400 million soldiers if they've only got simple guns to fight a mechanized invasion force. That's why I went in Syria in 2015, when Russia's air force obliterated entire rebel cities. Hence, Warsaw is sensibly not only focusing on manpower, but also overwhelming firepower. In many recent contracts, this has taken the form of mass purchase orders for attack helicopters. In July, Warsaw struck a deal with an Italian arms manufacturer to buy 32 AW-149 Leonardo military helicopters for $1.83 billion. Yet this contract was almost immediately overshadowed by one they signed with Boeing. Announced in September, the deal will see the aerospace company supply 96 of their AH-64E Apache attack helicopters, one of the most advanced models in existence. This complements a separate order for 48 F-A-50 light fighter jets already in place with South Korea, itself an improvement on a pre-existing contract for American F-35s. Clearly, Warsaw is getting serious about air power. And who can blame them? While Ukraine has managed to deny Russia air superiority, its own small air force has meant it can't claim to control the skies either. In case of conflict, Poland doesn't want to rely on air denial to save its cities, although there will also be plenty of that. That's thanks to a huge $5 billion contract for new Patriot missile systems, perhaps the last word in shooting down everything from long-range rockets to cruise missiles. In fact, they're so good at their job that Russia keeps threatening massive escalation if anyone lends any batteries to Ukraine. Not wanting to be in a similar position, Poland is getting their orders in already. The same goes for perhaps the most famous American weapon currently being used in the Ukraine war, HIMARS. Standing for High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, HIMARS are fast-firing, high-precision, and extremely extremely deadly rocket launchers. The arrival of just 16 of them over the summer, along with six British M270 systems, was enough to start turning the tide of war in Kiev's favor. Well, Poland now wants to buy 500 of them. Again, 16 were enough to put Russia on the back foot in Ukraine. 500 would be like bringing an atom bomb to a knife fight. Now, that giant order was placed back in June, and Warsaw has since complained that the US is unable to fulfill the target in a reasonable time frame. Still, they haven't given up on advanced rocket systems. Alongside a continuing HIMARS contract, a deal was announced in October for 288 South Korean Chunmu launchers. Amazingly, it appears that this will include technology transfers, potentially allowing Poland to start building homegrown rocket systems. Some even think that it will bring Poland's defense industry up to French levels. Yet this is still a fraction of what is planned. Because there's one more area Poland is investing heavily in, an area that will catapult their army to the forefront of Europe. We're talking, of course, about tanks. One of the oddest takes to come out of Russia's invasion of Ukraine was that this was the end of the tank. That Ukrainian soldiers with a lightweight stinger and javelin missiles had shown how easy it is to now take out heavy armor. That conclusion was a bit rushed. While Moscow's tanks were indeed knocked out in the fight in astonishing numbers, it was more due to an utter failure of the Russians to combine their heavy metal with other ground forces that made them so vulnerable. At least, that's what Warsaw is hoping. The Polish government has bet big on the continued utility of tracked killing machines. So big that by 2030, they should have more tanks than France, Britain, Germany, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands combined. The total target number is 1,500. That's significantly less than America's 6,333 modern tanks or China's 5,800, but it's still a huge number by European standards. France has fewer than 230. Germany is supposed to be aiming for 328. These are numbers Poland laughs at. In the last 10 months, Warsaw has already transferred over 240 tanks left over from the Soviet era to Ukraine to support Kyiv. And while that has created a temporary shortage, the plan is that more will soon arrive. Way, way more. 
August 2022 saw a $1.15 billion contract inked with US company General Dynamics Land Systems for 250 Abrams battle tanks. Specifically, the order was for M1A2 System Enhancement Program version 3 Abrams sentence which means nothing to most people but just made a whole bunch of military geeks suck in air and go damn son destined for the first warsaw armored brigade these tanks will form the backbone of a whole new mechanized division one that should be operational by 2025 Bulking it out would be other kits on order from the United States, like 17 Joint Assault Bridge Systems and 26 M88A2 Hercules Armored Recovery Vehicles. But the US contract is really just a sideshow. It's a nice bit of diversification. The real killer order was placed with South Korea. The K2 Black Panther tank is Hyundai's Monster on Wheels, a 55-ton killing machine equipped with automated anti-tank missile defenses that requires just three men to crew it. Poland wants nearly a thousand of them. A contract has been signed for 980, with the first 180 imported and the remaining 800 built in Poland, again with technology transfers to boost Poland's own industry. It is an eye-watering order, one of the biggest South Korea's defense industry has ever received. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Hidden below the contract also includes 648 K9 Crab self propelled howitzers, plus a whole load of light armored vehicles. Ultimately, if all deliveries are made, Poland should wind up with the second biggest tank army in Europe. Only Russia, which began the Ukraine war with 2,800 active service tanks and over 10,000 in storage, would have more. Even now, we're still only beginning to scratch the surface of what Warsaw is planning. We haven't even talked about their orders for drones, for example. But rather than continuing to run down exactly what Poland is buying, now might be the time to ask a more pertinent question, one which gets right to the heart of this subject. Can Warsaw actually make this happen? In the coming years, we're going to witness a fascinating experiment play out in Central Europe, one which will determine whether a mid-level military power can really catapult itself into the big leagues in less than a decade. And while the very real threat of Russia means Warsaw might well pull it off, there are also reasons to be cautious. The biggest of which may be that it's not even certain Poland can afford to do this. This isn't to knock the Polish economy. Since the fall of communism, Poland has gone from being on a par with Ukraine to one of Europe's success stories. It has a young, educated workforce, a manufacturing base, and even managed to ride out the pandemic relatively unscathed. But still, 5% of GDP on defense is a hell of an ask. Israel manages it. Some Gulf states like Saudi Arabia manage it. Everyone else, well, no, not at all. That's because throwing 5% of your GDP at the military has a huge knock-on effect across the economy. To get away with it, you need to either be hugely rich or facing an existential threat. PIS, of course, would argue that the existential threat is very much there. And it's worth pointing out that opposition parties nearly all oppose the 5% target. Despite unanimously backing the spending rise to 3%, there's a growing feeling among the opposition that going further is just a reflex action, one not supported by Poland's actual needs. As the former chief of Poland's National Security Bureau, Stanislav Kozier, put it, OK, we need tanks and howitzers. But do we need so many from the strategic and operational standpoint? There is no clarity as to why the ministry suddenly announced all those deals. This might be why the opposition is pledging to review all military contracts if they win power in the 2023 election. And that's a serious threat, because after eight years in power, PIS looks shakier in the polls than ever before. There's even a theory doing the rounds that these spending plans are just red meat for PIS's right-wing voters, that the government itself will row back after the election. Yet even if it doesn't, there are still possible barriers between Poland's military dreams and reality. One of the most pertinent is population decline. With a massive influx of Ukrainian refugees this year, anywhere between 1 and 2 million, depending on which source you ask, Poland certainly doesn't feel empty right now. But this masks a deep-seated demographic decline. Poland's population year on year has been flat or shrinking since 1998. Lots of young people continue to move abroad for work, while the birth rate is at an all-time low. That means there simply may not be enough able-bodied people to serve in the army that Warsaw is building. While millions would certainly sign up in case of an actual invasion, a professional army needs professional young men and women in its ranks at all times. In the gloomy words of General Ramond Andrzejczak, there simply may not be that many Polish warriors. 
That isn't to say that there's no way Poland could fulfill its grand plans. There are creative ways around all the issues in this chapter. Still, it's clear that Poland will have to undergo some serious changes if it really is to become Central Europe's biggest military power by 2030. But then, with the threat they're facing on their doorstep, those changes may be both desired and necessary. At the time of recording, polls show way over 90% of polls consider Russia a threat, and a sense of threat can lead to enormous changes in what the public wants overnight. Just ask Finland and Sweden, whose citizens went from being against NATO to all for it after Russia's invasion. In other words, a powerful Poland is more than merely possible. It is a real concrete route that Warsaw may actually be walking down, tiptoeing towards a destiny that could make it one of Europe's major players. How this would affect the EU and NATO remains to be seen, but one thing is for sure. Since February 24, 2022, countries near Russia and Belarus have faced a horrific dilemma, one in which their very survival may be at stake. Some, like Finland and Sweden, have chosen to abandon neutrality and get defense guarantees from NATO. Some, like Hungary, have chosen to instead kowtow to Putin, trying to remain on Moscow's good side, even in the depths of a savage war. Right now, Poland represents another form of reaction, one that believes a depraved adversary like Putin only respects strength, that only by becoming powerful can they defend their society. It's only in the coming years that we will discover which of these options was right. But one thing is for sure. If any country could pull off this near impossible task, it's probably Poland, a country that knows only too well what it means to fight for your freedom.